This is going to be a discussion, a uh, talk on research. I've done this many times in different formats and so on and so forth. Um, and I'd like, what I'd like to do, um, one of my professors in grad school, writing uh, professor said he can teach everything he knew about writing in 45 minutes. And then we said, well, geez, why are we around for three more years? Um, and he said, the rest is practice and practice and application, more practice and more mentorship and on and on. And all of that's true. It, because writing is a skill as opposed to a, a knowledge base. And almost like hitting a golf ball, you can do it and you, and you have the, the theory, but you have to have the practice over and over. So research is one of the things I like to think about too. And I like to work inductively from concrete examples to a uh, theory of craft. Uh, so we'll look at several examples, and I use my book, uh, or books, because that's what I know. And I, I know what I did in those books to achieve whatever the end result was. Before we get started, uh, I'd like you to take out a piece of paper and jot down what you think are, and do this very quickly, what you think are the two most important reasons a creative writer does research. Okay, does everybody have two? Or we'll come back, we'll come back to this later. Um, what I'm going to do now is to um, read a portion, a very short portion from Beautiful Assassin, the book that I had signed. And for those who didn't get a chance to read it or not taking this uh, seminar as, as credit, for credit, uh, a brief setup, it's, this is a story loosely based on a Russian female sniper in World War II. Her real name was Lyudmila Pavlichenko. That's the model for my character. It's not the same character. This story takes place in four months in 1942, beginning in June. Uh, and it was the first part of the novel takes place on the Eastern Front, in particular Odessa and Sevastopol. And the second part takes place in America where my character, based on that other character, Tatiana, comes to the States at the invitation and request of Eleanor Roosevelt to help promote the war effort here in America. And that part is all true. It's, she did come here, she did fight. Um, and I'm gonna read the first page and a half. Imagine a woman in a tree a silly, foolish young woman holding a gun and preparing to kill a man she does not even know. There she sits, waiting, hopeful of the smallest lapses that will spell death for her opponent. She is fearless. She has on her side the vanity of youth, the blindness that comes from a righteous sense of revenge. She believes herself on a sacred mission that each death she inflicts on the enemy brings her a little closer to peace. She doesn't yet know that she could kill every single German in the Third Reich and she would not find peace. She has yet to learn this, but she will. That time in the tree was mere luck, nothing more than that. In war, you cannot count on luck. You can only count on avoiding making mistakes. If you make one mistake in battle, you pay for it, usually with your life. That day, I made not one, but two mistakes. The first was hiding in the tree. The second was that I let myself daydream. If it was so unlike me to let my thoughts drift when I was in position, rifle at the ready, all of my senses heightened like those of a wolf stalking its prey. Such an indiscretion often end bad, ends badly, let me tell you. But there I was, recalling a summer morning before the war, remembering a way of life that seemed unreal, as gossamer as a fairy tale. In the memory, I lay in bed alone. Kolya, my husband, was already off to his job working in the city of Kiev. I recall that the bedroom window was open, the yellow curtains I'd made the first year of our marriage ballooning like a bellows, the cool air from the Nepper wafting into the room, and from the apartment below ours drifted the wistful cello notes of the music student who lived there. Mostly, though, what I remembered of that morning was the feeling that strange and altogether wondrous sensation somewhere deep inside a woman when she feels, no, when she knows, she is carrying life within her. I lay very still, feeling that life beginning in me, taking hold, filling me, knowing already that I loved the tiny creature that was sharing my body, loved it with all my heart and soul, loved it so much that the tears welled up in my eyes as I listened to something hauntingly beautiful by Rachmaninoff. I thought to myself, this is love, this feeling, this moment. I had never felt it before, not even with my husband, but I knew right then what it was. At that moment, the war had faded far, far away. Okay, so that's the opening uh, after the prologue, there's a prologue, but that's the opening of the main portion that's told by Tatiana. Uh, 
in order to write that section, even that section, what would I need to know? What are some of the things I would need to know to write that in terms of research? Well, you'd have to know tactics of snipers. Okay. Whether or not they're you know, being in a tree, which is a very stupid place to be. <laughs> okay, tactics, tactics of snipers. And I would have to need, I would need it there and throughout the novel, but certainly, is that a tactic? Do you go in a tree? Is that odd? Is that unusual? Is that normal? Okay, so that's one thing. What else would I need to know? Yes. Composers that people played from in music school during that time. Okay, very good. Rachmaninoff is fairly easy, but he's a Russian composer, and, and by the way, in those days, in that time in Kiev, in the 30s, uh, the Russian composers, sometimes up and down, and later on I use another <coughs> Russian composer here that Shostakovich that loses uh, his way and then is, then is uh, applauded by the, by the powers that be. So you'd have to do some, a little bit of uh, research, even in this small section, about Rus Russian music. Da? And I would imagine that you want to find out exactly what feels, it feels like to be inside their house, their apartment. Okay, yeah, and where the Dnieper is. If, if, first of all, you have to know that the Dnieper is, is near the Kiev and, and some basic things like that. So what would I need for that, by the way? What's one thing, I, and I, I, I use many of these throughout this novel in terms of research, huh? A map. A map. Yeah, a map. I had in front of me this uh, bulletin board, and I put up maps, and I put up faces, and, and unlike some of my books that I'm developing the characters out of whole cloth, this character was real. And so I used this character. I changed this character, but I used it as, as a basis, as a springboard to my fictional character. Okay, so I had pictures. I had maps. Sometimes I draw my own maps. There's a scene later on, and I'll read a very small portion of it in a moment, a scene later on where she's at a place fighting in Odessa, excuse me, in Sevastopol. And so I had to get war maps and to see where they were. And it's in the final days of the siege. It was a year-long siege in Sevastopol and very bloody and very brutal. And the, and the Germans simply leveled the whole city. And the, the, the Russians, I'll say Russians, although I mean Soviets, were slowly being pushed toward the sea. And this last, the scene that I'll read, they're right on the sea. And their, their backs are right up against the sea. And I'll, I'll read that. So maps. Pictures. What else is this scene? Would I need? Yes. Um, I was struck by your description of being pregnant. So mm -hmm. I would assume that you'd be speaking to women and maybe finding out what that feels like. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and in some ways, that's the easiest and that's the hardest to get at. Okay. The other stuff is technical, and you can get it. You can find it. But how does it feel to be this person? Okay. How does it feel to be not only a woman in general, but this woman in particular? Uh, so you, how, how would it, what would I do for that? You talk to women. You talk to women who are pregnant. I had been married, and I, my wife had a couple of kids, and I remember talking to her when she was pregnant and seeing her and being with her. There's that. So if you don't have that experience, you need to find out that experience, and I'll talk more about that. Again, we're just talking uh, inductively here, examples. Jim? Uh, I, I think I'd always want to know what the hardest part of that person's day is. That kind of gives me a depth of measure to, to the, to how much actual suffering He's right. End the seminar. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is the crux right there. What is the, I, I never heard that put that way. The hardest part of that person's day. That's brilliant. It, it is. I have never put it that way, but I, I, I aim for that. If you're a sniper, what is the hardest part? So what I had, do, had to do in, this, in re, uh, researching this novel, I had to find out what does a sniper do? And, and the hardest part, they got to get up way before, I was going to get into this in a, in a moment, but way before the sun comes up, they had to get in their position, they had to be quiet, they had to, you know, muzzle, they had to put stuff around their gun, uh, they had to be there with their, sp uh, their spotter, they had to be, and then they had to be perfectly still. Okay, for a long, long time. And the hard, that was the hardest part of the day, getting there, getting in position, being ready. Okay? Now, you said, what is the hardest part of, one per per, of a person's day? Think, and by the way, don't be thinking of my novel, be thinking of your novel. Use this as a metaphor, an example of what you're doing. As I'm talking, you should be thinking about your novel. You should be jotting down things, oh, in my novel I need to do this, oh, in my novel I need to do this. In fact, when you read my book, or any book, you should have a pen in your hand, in the back of the book, take notes for your book, okay? Whether it be technical, whether it be emotional, what does it mean to be a woman, or as June said, very perceptively, so what is the hardest part of any, this person's day? That's brilliant. 
And uh, in addition to finding those things, uh, I'll jump ahead of myself here again, but that's fine. I want to give you as much as I can give you, and if you have questions, please stop me. I, I, in doing research, you'll have a plan, and you'll say, I need to know this, and I'll talk more about where I start, how I focus, how I narrow in. But in doing research, you'll have these uh, moments of serendipity, and you'll find things that just open up whole other spheres. And getting back to June's point, I stumbled on a YouTube video of a woman in her 80s. Picture, not a woman in a tree, but picture an old woman in her 80s or 90s who fought in the war. And they interviewed her, okay? And she has gray hair and she's small and she's speaking Russian or Ukrainian and she, her words are being translated. And she said, I remember the first German I killed. I remember the first German I killed. I sighted him. I was in, I was, it was close to Berlin, I sighted him in, I got him in my crosshairs, and then my hand started to shake. And my hand shook and shook and shook, and I said to myself, this is an enemy, I need to kill him, but he's also a man, he's also a human being, he's somebody's son, somebody's brother, somebody's husband, okay? And she said, I was going to end his life. And my hand shook, and I controlled my, my emotions, and I pulled the trigger, and I saw him go down, and the tears came down my face. And as I read that, I said, oh my God, I, I, knew that, I thought I knew what the hardest part of the day was, because in all my research about the Ludmila Pavlachinko, she was hard as nails. She never showed this at all, ever. But this one woman showed this other side. So in the last chapter, the last part of the first chapter, she shoots a German. And she goes up to him, and she's angry with him. And she's angry because he made her kill him. And she hates him for that, because she feels terrible that he made her kill him. And I got that, and that was the hardest part of her day here. Okay? So that's, that's a very good point. Other things that you'd have to know in the first chapter. Yes? You'd have to know uh, how it's more complicated for a female soldier than for a male soldier. Very good. And I have some handouts, and I'm going to talk about that very issue. Why is it harder from a for a female soldier than a male. And there were something like 80,000 or so females that fought in World War II and something like five or 10,000, depending on how you counted them, snipers. And many of them received the Hero of the Soviet Union Medal, which is the, the comparable, the Congressional Medal of Honor. Okay, so they fought bravely. And we're, we're 60, 70 years later, we're finally getting to that point, should we allow women to fight in war? They were already doing it, and not by choice, okay? Um, so, and I'm going to read a passage about that very issue. But what, how is it tougher for a woman? Later on, after she comes back after this day with her trophies, his gun, his medals, his chocolate that, he, that she got out of his, his uniform, which they passed around and ate, one of the males uses his maleness because he's jealous of what she's done. And this woman, the actual woman, killed 309 Germans in one year. And she had the most kills of anybody in the entire Russian army in that first year. There was another guy later on that killed 500. But in that one year, she had the most. And there was a great deal of anger and jealousy surrounding her. So there was that, too. There was a tension there. Even though the Soviet Union, I had to know this, too, even though the Soviet Union had, at least in theory, equality of the sexes, like any place, there's none. There's not. Okay. So that's another thing. What else? Yes? Yeah. And in this passage that I read, what's the deepest thing that drives her? Revenge. Revenge. Revenge connected to what? Even though I didn't say it here. Death of, death, of her daughter. death of her daughter. Okay. And I don't know how her daughter died. Her children did die. And I think she had more than one. Her children did die in war. And I took that and used it in a different way. I, I wasn't a slave to my research. And that's another point you should be. You're a fiction writer. You're a creative writer. You're a memoirist. You're a poet. Don't be a slave to your, to your research. Okay, research, we'll talk about what research can do, but it, you should never be a slave to it. Okay, so I use my research to tell, I hope, an interesting story. Um, you know, a, as Dale was saying, uh, uh, you said again, say, just rephrase that or say it one more time. What are the deepest drives that they have that, um, and the rewards that they get for their particular behavior, the words that they use? Yeah, so, 
So here, the deepest, she, she's on a, a, a quest, a mission to kill the Germans because she wants revenge, and that revenge is connected to her child, the death of her child. And I get to that later on, but it hints at it here, okay? So that's, and that's all based on the research I did. I found that, I, I, there are lots of things that I made up in the book, but there's lots of things that research handed me, gave me, okay? So that's important. What else do we have to know in this, again, just this passage, Wendy? How in here? Um, because you said about direct motivation. I thought maybe, and also the expectations of women is, might be different than it is. Okay, cultural values. That's a good point. And, and I think that's going to apply to a lot of characters. It's certainly going to apply to my character. And you're going to see that by the end of chapter two here. What else? Huh? Yes? More basic, but just understand you know, Russian names. Russian names. Okay, Russian ideas, Russian thoughts, Russian words. I mean, if you're doing a historical piece, uh, you're going to sometimes use other words, okay? And you have to do it carefully. And, and I just finished reading a novel uh, called The Glass Room. Has anybody read The Glass Room? Uh, at first it drove me nuts because of all the Czechoslovakian and German uh, terms that they used. But later on I, it became a really, I think, a re if not a great novel, a very good and very interesting novel. Uh, anything else? Yes. Exactly. This was June, okay, and that's a very important point. And she was bathed in heavy duty stuff, to, so nothing, none of her skin would show, and she's got this heavy stuff. It's June, it's 95 degrees, it's hot, she's sitting in a tree, she's drenched in sweat, okay, and you have to know that, and you have to know, you know, if you're basing it on something real. The stuff around them, the stuff they have, the stuff they're wearing, the stuff they do. You know, the, if I read about another page, you'd see other details that would need research, her scope and, the, and her gun, okay? Uh, anything else in this, just this passage? Fred? Uh, the nature of the war at that particular time and place, was it mobile, was it stagnant? Nature of the war. At this point, it's almost Leningrad S, Stalingrad S. They're in a siege, they're fighting you know, door to door almost, okay? The, the Germans, I just looked at a map just recently before I came, did this re, uh, uh, lecture, and it shows June where the Germans were, and then later in June, and then still later in June, they're closing the ring, okay? And you had to know that, and where different, later on they're gonna be, uh, I'll read a passage where they're fighting on the heights uh, in, uh, um, in this, in this Sevastopol, and the heights were here, and the Germans were just a, like a pincer action, closing them down toward the sea, pushing them into the sea. So he had to know that too. Okay, all very good ideas. Um, let's see. Uh, if you take a look, um, well, before I take a look at the handouts, where did I get this business of the, the tree, uh, of her being in a tree? Well, Ludmila Pavlochenko handed it to me, okay? She had an article. She came to America and she wrote, people were interviewing her and I got many of the scenes come right out of her interviews with her on the streets of New York, in Washington, in Saturday Evening Post, in all these different magazines. She would give interviews and she would talk and sometimes she wrote the essays. And in one, she talks about how she had a duel with a sniper for several days. And this one time she thought she was gonna outfox them by climbing a tree. And being in the tree, she got there in the middle of the, night, middle of the darkness of morning, still night, and she said, from here I can see down on the German lines, I'll have a good angle with which to spot him and kill him finally. And the sun at her back, right? And the sun was at her back, okay, into his face. And what happened was, and this is true, that the bombs had been shattering and taking the trees and shaking them, that by June leaves were falling. Leaves were falling, and because of the gunpowder and the fires and so on, the heat, leaves were starting to fall. So instead of, it was an apple tree that was in a cemetery. She wrote all this, okay? It was an apple tree in a cemetery. She climbed this tree, and as soon as the sun came up, she said, oh my God, I really screwed up because there's all sorts of openings in the tree. She's, she's not hidden. And what the real woman did, she stayed there, and they started shooting at her. And she's behind a small branch of the tree, and she said, they're going to kill me. And what she did, and what I had my character do in that first chapter, for those who read it, what does she do? She pretends to be she's shot, and she falls down and lands, and she waits there all day long for the German to come up 
And indeed, he came up, and when he did, she picked up a rifle and killed him. That's a real story. That's what she said. I, if she's lying, then I'm lying too. But I believed her, okay? She was so, in her interviews, so literal and so, you know, uh, when they'd say to her, um, uh, what do you want to do? And she'd say, she's over here f eating and feasting, and they're giving her fur coats and guns and whining and dining her. And she kept saying, I want to go back and kill Germans. I want to go back and kill Germans. Okay, that's the way she was. So when she said this, I believed it. And she handed me this whole scene. And it was too good not to use as fiction. So one of the things that in doing research is that sometimes whole scenes will be just handed to you, okay, given to you. And that, that's another reason for uh, you know, doing, doing research. Okay, if you take a look at handout number one. Okay, this comes from the book itself. You've probably read this chapter if you came here. And uh, if, you, if you look, there's some, there's some details. Like, um, from my pocket, I took out a certificate. The man had a red face at the recruiting office. Oh, so Viacom, that's the paramilitary organization. It was almost like the Hitler Youth. Okay, it was the Soviet kind of Hitler youth where they do physical things. In this case, she was, she was an actual marksman, the real woman. And Kiev and 7.62 millimeter shots and so on. And the Mosin Nagant uh, rifle. Okay, and uh, we don't have to read all this, but she has, there's a scene in which she goes up to the uh, recruiting station and, and the recruiter says to her, you're a woman, you sign up for become a nurse. Okay, um, and she says, no, I have my certificate. Here's what I've done. I am a marksman. I, I'm very good at using it. I want to kill Germans. And he says, no, no, you're a, you're a girl. Go, go home, okay? So she shows up the next day and so on and so forth. I, I, I sort of condensed that. But if you look at the last handout, okay, this is from a woman named Ludmila Pavlichenko, her. The line of volunteers at the entrance to the Vodnoy Transportny Mil District Military Registration and Enlistment Office, notice a very long term, uh, was so long that my turn only came when it began to grow dark. The military commissar, uh, commissar's office was stuffy and laden with cigarette smoke. People kept coming and going. His face blue red. The commissar was saying something in a hoarse voice. Looking up at me, he barked, medical personnel will be called up from the front tomorrow but it had not even been be, be, begun. From my bag, I took out my document, certifying that I had finished school for snipers and put it in front of him. This obviously irritated him. He snapped, his, his, he snapped that sniper was not an army trade and then added something about women wanting to be soldiers, right? About women and men and, and service. And, uh, and without realizing the difficulties and so on and so forth, Early the next morning, I was back, and she insists that he takes her as a, as a soldier, not as a, not as a nurse or medical personnel. Again, this, my scene is expanded, elaborated, but basically she told me what it was like to be denied, to be uh, uh, treated as a woman in a man's world, her desire to want to kill Germans, the fact that she had a certificate, and all this stuff. Again, another whole scene is handed to me through the research. Okay, so uh, that's, that's something else that, again, in doing research. Okay, so uh, a couple of questions here. The larger issues. What else would I need to know to write this book? If you read the whole thing, or if you read part of it, or from even what I'm saying, beyond what we've already talked about, what else would I need to, to know? You'd need to know about the attitudes toward the Soviet Union and the United States and who the players were. Okay. I'm going to put down cultural and military attitudes. And you right? have to know a whole lot about Eleanor Roosevelt. And, <laughs> and a lot about Eleanor Roosevelt. Okay. Okay, Eleanor Roosevelt. I had to read two books. I, I should have read more, but again, you're not a researcher. You're not an academic researcher. You're a novelist or you're a memoirist or you're a poet reading enough to get the job done. So Eleanor Rosa. What else? Uh, how, uh, the translators work when they brought the, the, the Russian donors. I mean, they didn't speak the same language. So yeah, translators. Yeah. Good. Yep. Um, what about history and history dates? Okay, some dates. Dates. And history. I mean, if you're, if you're writing a historical novel, obviously you want to know those things. But I would argue that I, I've, I've published uh, three books that are uh, in present time. 
or relatively recent, and I've done probably as much research for those as, I, as I've done for this book. Okay, so so you need to know some of these things as you go along, no matter what you're writing. Okay, what else? The yeah, huh? Jim, and then come back here. Yeah, uh, I think those are important, but I also think it's important uh, to know how much the uh, individuals, the uh, low-ranking soldiers, view about their own culture and military. Okay. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to talk about perspective. You know, what's their angle of viewing things, okay? For instance, my character goes to a big ball, okay? And who's there but a guy named Uncle Joe. Yeah. Okay? And other famous people. Uh, and she doesn't know all of that stuff from <laughs> let's say their level. She knows it from the level of a, of a rank and file soldier. Okay, so she's going to have a limited perspective. And just like when she comes to Amer America, she's going to have an even more limited perspective. She only knows what she knows. So I, I read a number of things about what does an average soldier know, think, feel towards the Soviet Union. For instance, when the Germans came into the Ukraine, and my character was, was a Soviet, but Ukrainian Soviet, many Ukrainians hated the Germans, excuse me, hated the Russians. And many welcomed the Germans in. Come on in. Come on in. And things changed once they got there, but many of them will because they hated Moscow so much. And you had to know that. You had to know their perspective. And I do a little bit of that there. And there was a great, I also had to know that there was a great uh, famine in the 1930s in Ukraine. Okay, the Holomador. Okay? The economy. The economy. So the economy here, um, the social, okay, social, uh, political, economic situation. <laughs> Okay, um, and, and of the Russian soldiers. What else do I have to know? From the United States perspective, you have to know the workings of the Secret Service and military ranks and how they interacted and who had priority throughout the troops. Yeah, not, it was not Secret Service then, but the, the, uh, the OSS, yeah. Um, yes? The way in which uh, real people in history spoke, like Eleanor Roosevelt, or, you know, the cadence that happened. Yeah, I'm going to get back to language in a minute, but language is important. Okay? Yes? You have to know uh, how the journalist is working. At the beginning. Yeah. We'll, and you picked the journalist point of view, right? <laughs> okay, uh, the, in the prologue and the epilogue. Okay? And that took a lot of research, too, and that was a, at a different angle to the story. Um, what else? Yeah? The, the political factions within the U.S. government? Okay, the political, and I'll, I'll just sort of put another check here, right? And, yeah? About the progress of the Manhattan Project. Yeah, and I had to do, do so much research on that and, and the stuff that was going on and the, and the, the kinds of stuff that the, the Soviets were doing here, okay? And the fact that, you know, we were on the supposedly, nominally, on the Soviet side, but we, we also knew that after the war we were going to be against them. It was just a given, okay? So we passed between the British and ourselves any of the facts about the Manhattan Project, but we did obviously share them with the Soviets, okay? So they wanted to get at what we had, and there was a whole thing, and they had all, I read a couple of books on that, and there was so many crazy ideas that they were sort of trying. One was to blackmail Eleanor Roosevelt. That was it. Blackmail that she was lesbian, a lesbian, and therefore put it out there and that she would give some of the, as if it was going to crack her, okay? They didn't know Eleanor Roosevelt, okay? Uh, a little tough cookie for them. Uh, other comments? Other things we might need? I think within these larger contexts, you can't lose track of the details, like food and yeah. and yeah. Yeah. yeah, the details, okay? And as a couple of people are saying, the details of her life, okay? So. What I do when I'm doing research is I start, if I'm writing about a lawyer, if I'm writing about a doctor, if I'm writing about whatever, start with the immediate details of what is their profession like? What is her profession? I've shot guns all my life, but I never shot a 6.2 Moisen Nagant. And I was lucky enough that a friend of mine had a Russian sniper gun with, a, with the attached uh, scope. I didn't shoot it, but I held it, I worked the bolt, okay? And so I felt comfortable doing that. How many shots can you get off in five seconds or 10 seconds, okay? So you did. Food. I had to go online and I got hundreds of pictures of 
you know, hardtack and military rations, both in the, the Germans and what the Germans would have because she robs him at, after she kills him, and what would she have? Okay, what would they have? What would they eat? Okay, so I had to learn a lot of that stuff. You know, I had to learn about other guns. I had to learn, there's a scene later on where there are, you know, uh, there are uh, tanks, uh, panzer tanks, okay, or surrounding them. You had to know about that. So lots of stuff. And that's her life. If you're writing about an ophthalmologist, if you're writing about, let's say, a lawyer, if you're writing about a hunter, you have to know that life. You have to understand what that life is about. Okay, anything else? I mean, I, there's more, more. Fashion, you dressed her up for a so you have to know what fashions were and how fabric was available. And Ex exactly. When I was writing this book, uh, there was, it was the late 90s, early 2000s, we didn't have the access to online stuff that we do now. So I went to the library and got three books on fashion. Okay, clothes through the ages. And I would go through that when I needed to have them wear something. The same thing with Soul Catcher. I had to have them wearing something. And so I, I would need to know what they would wear. So if you start, if you're writing historical or if you're writing currently but something that's not you. And as I always say, you know, the old dictum of write about what you know, I think that's very boring. I think write about what your, your passion is. Where did this idea come from? I should back up a little bit more. For me, I was coming down the stairs in my house in Guilford, and I had the History Channel on, and I came across the end of uh, a History Channel segment on snipers, and I heard about 25 seconds that said, and she was the greatest female sniper of all time. What? <laughs> what? And then I saw her name, and the next day I went to Fairfield University and looked up a little, there was a little bit of a quote, and I went to the, the guy who does, a guy named Jonathan, who's great at the library, Right? And uh, he got me three or four books and articles, and then it was a constant barrage of stuff that he sent me. Okay? Um, so I had to learn that stuff, and, and, and by doing research, it just started to open things up for me. Okay. All right, um, in, in terms of why do research? Okay, that's the question. And I asked you, why do research? Before I give you my list, I'd like to hear what you think are the most important items that why we, why creative writers do, do, do research? Authenticity. authenticity. Precision. Precision, kind of authenticity, right? A number, another form of that? Credibility. Credibility. Believability. Verisimilitude, Belie believability. Uh, huh? Intimacy. Intimacy. Okay, what do you mean by that? Okay, take all of that other stuff. Intimacy, ver verisimilitude, authenticity, precision, all of that stuff. It comes down to we have to create characters that are interesting and believable, that, 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 our, that our readers can understand and identify with and see the complexity in, okay? And, and that's the uh, notion of intimacy. Okay, June said it in a different, what's a, another way of looking at it? What's the toughest thing this person's gonna do today? It's intimate. But intimacy, and so all of your research, in a sense, should be in one way or another, intimacy, getting into this character. Let me give, hold those thoughts for just a minute. I got about 200 pages into this novel, and I was telling it in third person. Okay, for those of you who are asking me or asking other people, should I tell it in first person or third person? I don't know. <laughs> Because at least two of my novels, I started one person and switched to another, and sometimes I even switched back. But I, if I go back to what Sam was saying, intimacy, my agent sat down with me, my editor sat down with me, and she, he said, I don't think you're close enough. I don't think you're close enough. I don't think you're in her head, in her heart. And I read it, and I didn't feel I was in her head or her heart. And I did this also with another novel, uh, Blind Side of the Heart. I told it, the first, but I didn't go so far. It was only about 50 or 60 pages, and I switched from third to first, okay? And I wasn't in uh, Ludmila or Pavlichenko or Tatyana. Uh, I wasn't in her heart. I didn't know her heart. I didn't feel her heart. And so I switched, and then I had to go through the whole thing. It's not, as you know, who've, you've, who've done that, it, it's not a matter of going from she or he to I, because it, you have to change the voice. You have to get into her skin. And I had to do that. And after that first page or two, I started to feel her. 
feel her baby growing here, feel what it was like to lose a child, okay? And fortunately, fortunate, I've not lost a child. But if we, in using our research, we can use our, uh, you know, our imaginative uh, leap, uh, you know, the, the notion of empathy, imaginative empathy, or empathetic, empathetic imagination. I talked about that a uh, couple, couple of residencies ago. If we can do that, we can use all this stuff to get more intimate, closer to our characters and to our story. Okay, so I actually went from third to first, and I mean, I'm not the only person who's done that. Uh, uh, William Golden in uh, get, uh, Memoirs of a Geisha went from third to first to try to get inside of his character. That doesn't always work, but it worked in this, for me, it worked in this case. Um, so what, what's some other things that we need to, why do we research? Uh, huh? Yes? Accountability. Accountability, what do you mean? <laughs> okay. What did she mean? That's a good point. You want to be accountable. So we can say, and I've had writers say, well, you don't need to do that. Uh, Edward P. Jones, in a, what I thought was a really g wonderful, if not a great novel, uh, The Known World, okay? Uh, I, I, I was captivated by it, and I remember reading a, a, an interview with him later on that all of the figures, all of the numbers about, it's a novel about slaves owning slaves in pre-war, uh, you know, 1830s in Virginia. All of the detailed numbers he had, of figures in different counties, I think it was Manchester County, were made up. Were all were made up. Now, I have writer friends that say, big deal, it's a story, it's a novel, it's not nonfiction. I felt cheated. I felt cheated. So when I do research, and that, not saying you have to do, but when I do research, I want that authenticity. I want that verisimilitude. I want that credibility, that precision. Uh, I, I want it for the reader but I want it for myself, okay? I want to be, if not 100% right, I want to be close to being right, okay? I, uh, one of my books, um, uh, A Dream of Wolves, it was about a doctor, and I did a lot of research. He's an OBGYN doctor. I did not deliver any babies, okay? But I did get a note from a doctor that said, how long have you been practicing? And I said, well, I hope I haven't been practicing at all, okay? I, I've never, but I had to feel, and in, there's a scene where he has to uh, deliver a baby by C-section, okay? And I had to do a lot of stuff so I could feel comfortable to do that and get in and, and, and get in that scene and feel comfortable and, and pull it off. So there's authenticity. What else do we need to know? Oh, are we doing research? Research, yeah. What, why do we research? Open up your possibilities. Mm -hmm. Find your possibilities. Open up your possibilities. That's in the top two. That's in the top two. We're going to have about four in the top two. <laughs> Charlie? You had said that the stories give themselves to you. you know, That's in the top four, too. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Things are given to you in research. Okay? Yep. Yeah, I think the word for that is uh, discovery. Discovery. Okay, good. These are all great things. And I, and I don't mean to downplay the importance of verisimilitude. Very, very important, okay? The appearance or semblance of truth, okay? Uh, to, uh, here's, here's one, and it sort of touches on what, what Elizabeth is saying, is that I say it's to get a feel for the fictional, or non-fictional if you're doing memoir, or poetic, okay, landscape. You want to feel comfortable, okay? How can I write this scene about her in a tree if snipers, snipers never did that? She told me they did it. She told me she did it. So even if most snipers didn't do it, and by the way, after this, I looked at about five YouTubes where snipers are shooting other snipers in trees. Okay, so it, not only did she say it, but I felt it was comfortable <coughs> enough that others did it as well. But to get back to Elizabeth's point, you want to feel comfortable with your own fictional landscape. You want to feel, I can enter this world. It's not just their world, it's my world. I know what's going on in this world. If you're writing a memoir about your family, find out what was going on in 1942. The cars, the food, the house. What do they do? What do they think? What's going on on TV if there's an early TV in the 40s? What's going on in, in the country? Know that stuff. That's where research comes in. And you do research. Um, Hemingway said, 
you, you do enough, you know enough about your subject to leave stuff out. Know enough about your stu- subject to leave stuff. And why? why? When my freshmen do a research paper, they pour everything in. Okay? Because they want to expand. They want to get to those eight pages or ten pages. They want to show you how much they know. They don't want to do a good research paper to convince you or persuade you or, uh, or uh, uh, entice you. They want to show you all that they know. You don't want to do that. You're telling a story, whether it be a memoir or a poetic story or a fictional story. You want to tell a story. And you have to know enough, as Elizabeth said, so you feel comfortable there. You're in that world. You're not outside looking in. You're in that world. You're in that tree. Okay? You're in that tree. Um, I'm going to read another. Keep those thoughts. Yep. If I can ask a quick question. I mean, sure. Does that amount of research, though, ever get in the way of flow of writing? Yes. And I'll get to that. That's a good point. I think I'll get to it. If I did my research right, I'll know I planned this out. Okay. Um, this is at the end, just before Sevastopol collapses. And I, I took not this particular scene, but where um, Ludmila Pavlichenko said it almost this way, this matter-of-factly. Okay? So in my book, um, uh, uh, Tatiana crawls through a sewer, comes up behind the German lines, because there's some sniper killing all of their men and, she, and, and women. She gets up behind, she peeks over a, like a parapet, and she looks down and she sees she's behind the German lines and they're all vulnerable now, they're all open. And she scopes trying to find where the sniper is. And, and it was almost verbatim, I took it almost word for word from what she wrote, and it was so easy to do, it was just, you know, it was like shooting fish in a barrel, no pun intended. Every pun intended. Okay, so here's what she says. I made a quick scan of the area looking for the sniper's position, then got out my field glasses and carefully glassed the area below me inch by inch. Nothing. I continued looking, still nothing. I could keep searching, hoping to find him, or I could take what was given to me. I decided on the latter course. Slowly, I slid the barrel of my rifle through the crack in the wall. I shot the machine gunner first. Then, before his assistant knew what had happened, I shot him too, both in the back. I moved down the line toward the other Germans in the trench. I shot a soldier smoking a cigarette. Then a man loading a mortar. When his companion reached for his rifle, I shot him too. I continued down the line and shot three more men. It was like shooting targets at the range. I wasn't thinking, just acting on instinct a soldier's instinct. I had no fear. I figured my life was over already, and I thought only of killing as many as I could before I died. And that was almost what she said in one of the articles that I read. I shot this one. His companion looked. I shot him. Another one crawled out. I killed him. I thought, oh my God, I wouldn't want to mess with this woman. She was amazing. Well, I, I, as I read a section like that, I mark it, I put it down in a notebook, I may grab it if it's online and plug it down in my, what I, I have. I have my, my pages where I have my novel beginning and I have my pages where my research is and I can plunk it down and I number it and usually I have 20, 30, 40, 50 pages of research notes before I start or as I'm writing my novel and it's there and I can grab it and I can look at it. Okay, I don't usually take it the moment I do it, occasionally I do, but mostly it's there uh, waiting, fermenting, and I'll come back to that too. Okay, a couple of things. Um, I want to feel comfortable with where I am. Uh, I want to put things on my stage. I tell writers, even if they're not doing research, if you have a character in a house, okay, what are you going to do with a character in a house? You've got to have a table. You've got to have a lamp. You've got to have a bottle. You have a, something on the table. You have a pair of scissors, something. You have to have a bird on somebody's head. <laughs> Where did I hear that? You've got to have stuff around them. And if you have stuff around them, they can react. Okay? They can do something. Okay? And so I try to fill up my landscape with stuff. Um, as I said, feel comfortable. To help me imagine scenes. Okay? And that's, that's the thing we talked about before. And in fact, I'd say that's probably the most important thing. To help me imagine scenes. Um, you know, we talked about verisimilitude. And we talked about credibility. And usually writers put those things down as the most important. 
verisimilitude and credibility, and that is important. It is clearly important, but it's important. I do research as much for myself as my audience, my reader. Okay, I want to find out so I'm there, I can use it, I know it, I'm one of the shooters here, I'm one of the snipers, or in the doctor book, I'm one of the doctors, okay? Um, I'm doing a novel now about a uh, middle distance runner, a Jewish middle distance run, German Jew uh, middle distance runner in, in 1936. So I had to read tons of books about running and being a runner, and I played sports but I never ran, and so I had to understand what it's like to be a middle distance runner, how they train, I had to come across th words like the 1930s fartlek. Anybody know what fartlek means? It's not what you think. It's a training technique. Okay. It has nothing to do with, with elimination. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, another example when I'm doing research. Okay. And I and there's book research and there's field research. There's online research and so on. In terms of the the uh, field research, that's where you get out and you talk to people or you go see things. Okay. For, um, for this book, I, I couldn't do a whole lot of field research except to go to New York and Washington. Uh, I didn't have the money to go to Odessa uh, or to Sevastopol. And if I went, the places that they saw no longer exist. The, the Germans leveled them. There was not a building standing when they finished. I saw pictures, it's all rubble. But what I did do here is I looked at picture after picture after picture of what the strand looked like in Sevastopol and how these two, she and her husband, Kolya, used to walk along it and their baby was out in the water and all of that. I had pictures of that. So that's the closest field research I could do there. In Soul Catcher, the novel that's set right before the Civil War, I jumped in my car one time and I went up to Lake Placid, okay, because one of my characters in that novel is um, John Brown, okay. And he was connected to a freed slave commune or society not too far from. Now, this is up near Lake Placid. I jumped in my car. I drove up there. I got, I swear to God, I got at least two chapters from that, from that visit. Okay? One chapter was coming down this very steep road. It's sleeting and snowing. And I pictured them on horseback going through this snowstorm, stopping here, stopping there. I saw John Brown's... Um, um, his farm, okay? He's got a lot of places all over the country, including out west and Kansas and Ohio and in Connecticut and in upstate New York. And there's John Brown's farm, not too far from where the Olympic jump is up there. So I drove up. It was open. Uh, there was no one there. It was March. I got out. I walked around. I had my camera. I always bring a camera. I took pictures. I walked over and I could, I stepped back, almost like Bill is doing, taking pictures here. And I looked at the whole scene. And I saw where his house was and where his barn was. And in my imagination, I imagined my, one of my characters coming out of the barn, a, a runaway slave, and John Brown and his, one of his sons coming out of the house. I could picture all this. And they met and they talked in my imagination. And I said, my goodness, this is going to be a scene. And if you look in, I think it's chapter three or chapter four, that's exactly what I do. And my other character, the main character, who is the slave hunter, the slave catcher, the soul catcher, is in the woods behind me, watching these with his other four uh, henchmen, if you will, and they're seeing all the scene, and they're making plans on how they're going to capture him and what they're going to do. And that was all sort of given to me by me going out there and doing research. I could see it. Feel research is important because you see it, you smell it, you taste it, you walk it. My first novel was set in Maine, and I drove up to, and it was about German POWs at a camp in Maine, and there was an actual camp. I drove up there many times. I had a feel for the place. That's another feel you have to get, not only the cultural feel, but the feel of the place. Okay? And if you can go to the place, go to the place, okay? where you can get out and walk it and smell it and take pictures of it and live it. Okay? So if you, if you have in mind a book that you're writing and you haven't been to that place at least a couple of times, go there if you can. So I got out and I, tra I tramped trapesy through the woods, and I took pictures, and I said, here's where the German POW camp was, right here. And I said, okay, now I can picture it. I can picture all of my book research being real, being in a time and a place right here. Okay, um, let me, uh, questions. I have, I have a couple more pages here, but I'd rather have some questions. Did you research and write at the same time, or did you just one Okay. In terms of research, I do a ton of research up front, and I would suggest that, especially if the, 
if the subject is new to you or distant from you in time and place, time or place. Do lots of research so that you get a whole, a broad and a deep view of where you are. Okay, do lots of research. And then I do research every day. Okay, I, I do research every day. I, what's the name of the car? Where, for instance, uh, my current novel, the one that's coming out in next year, um, Resting Places, it's about a 50, it's a current novel, it's about a 51-year-old woman whose son, a year before the novel opens, drives cross country and she gets a call that he had a car accident in New Mexico, car flipped over, he was thrown from and killed. And she didn't know why he was there, he was supposed to be in San Francisco, she didn't know what he was doing there, there was a bunch of other discrepancies in his death according to the police report and so on, and, and it's bugging her. So uh, in the novel she's going to get in her car at some point and, and go south go out to New Mexico and follow his trail. What did I do? I followed this trail and she followed my trail because I, oh, listen, I'm the boss, I'm the, I don't follow her trail, she followed my trail. But I drove out and I took hundreds of pictures and I stopped in a place where my character died, the little town, I drove out in the desert where his car actually flipped over and I saw it and I took pictures, so I knew it, I felt it, okay, I felt, I ate there, I felt what it was like there, okay, and I wouldn't know that if I didn't do that. That's research too. I call it fields research, yeah. Didn't that present a problem to you in, with this book? Uh, because you couldn't go to Russia? Yeah, I, I, yeah. That, that, it, that did present a problem. But that's why I went to New York a couple times. She gets out, she goes in Grand Central. I took pictures <laughs> of Grand Central and I went down to Washington, took, took pictures there. I took pictures of where Eleanor Roosevelt, you know, uh, or had pictures of where Eleanor Roosevelt had her secret garden. Okay, she actually had, I got that from the, from one of her uh, biographies. Um, and, and I had been out to Denver before, so I knew that area. Um, and w in Soul Catcher, I was in Virginia many, many times. So I knew that area too. Yes? Um, when you're talking about a public figure, especially what you did with Eleanor Roosevelt, her lesbianism was never something that was explicit. I think it was, it was a rumor. So how do you kind of deal with that in the fiction sense? Is it okay that's in the public domain? It's, uh, if she's a public figure, okay, she's a public figure. And there have been a number of books, that, uh, and I read one of those number, that clearly has a thesis that she was, she was lesbian. Roosevelt's son wrote a series of uh, detective stories in which he has his father with one partner and his mother with a female partner. Saying goodnight to everybody. And yeah. It was a little trickier uh, for uh, Ludmilla herself because she died in 1976 is buried in, in, um, uh, in Moscow. And I really wondered if, if I would get letters from, I don't even know if she has family. I, I worried about that, I, I was concerned about that, but I, I think I made a number of changes. If you go on Wikipedia and you look up uh, Beautiful Assassin, they say it's loosely based on the life of such and such, okay? So it's not a big secret. And I haven't been shot yet. <laughs> in, uh, in Soul Catcher, how did you handle the part about the I, I didn't. I, that's a good point. There's a, about a chapter or so in the Mexican-American uh, War in the 1830s. Uh, I didn't see the point of going down there for a chapter. Okay? It didn't seem crucial, but I did a ton of research online and read a number of books about the war and what happened and that terrible battle where my main character is, is wounded badly, almost killed. And the fact that the, that the Mexicans went from injured soldier to injured soldier and shot them. Yeah, so. I mean, the Americans weren't much better, but they did that. Yes? Is there any boundary when you're dealing with public figures about getting too close to the truth in a historical fiction or getting too far away from the truth? You mean legally? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I, I, you know, that's, I wouldn't be the one to ask that. I, I have my own concerns. I just write the damn thing and worry about it later. Okay. You know, if when I when I you know at Harper Collins, you know, they have lots of legal uh, legal uh, people looking at this stuff, and and uh, they'll say we think this is a little too close, or not close enough, or or whatever. Okay, I, I worry about as a writer. Okay, and certainly public figures are almost completely free game. We have a couple of lawyers here that you could ask that, and probably be, be better to answer it. Just a couple more things. Um, Language. Somebody said language before, and I don't want to forget that, and I want to open it up to some more questions in a moment, but language. And I, what I mean by that is the technical language of the people uh, that, that their jobs, their careers, their 
what happens around them, whether it be doctors or snipers. There's that language. There's the historical language. There is the cultural language, okay? Let's say in this case, I, need, I needed to know lots of Russian words, okay? Uh, and I, I would say this as, as one of my great uh, insights, it wasn't my insight, I sort of stole it from, from Russell Banks, in his novel Cloud Splitter about John Brown, he said that he used a, a dictionary from the 1830s and 40s. He got his hands on one. I got my hands on one for Soul Catcher, two in fact. And there were all these terms that, you know, you wouldn't know what they mean now. And I was able to sprinkle them, okay, sprinkle, okay. It's like if you're making a stew and you put in too much, it's, it's bad. But you can sprinkle and give a flavor for that. And that's, I think that's important. If you're dealing with, uh, let's say, when I was dealing with the doctor, I had like three general medical books uh, right at my desk. And if I needed to know, you know, uh, cesarean, what's the, where do you begin on that, or, or you know, uh, preeclampsia, uh, I, I needed to know that it's right there. I had that, so I could use technical language. But it's also the language of the period, whether it be the 1930s or, or now, or if you're dealing with a lawyer. Um, uh, um, let's see. Um, you know, if you're dealing with a lawyer, you need to know about law. Okay, other comments, questions? Yes. I would say any fiction, but certainly historical. But the additional challenge that you have, does it take longer, is it harder to bring the characters to life than when you're writing something contemporary? That's a good question. Um, I, I, guess, I guess I would say all of this research is intended to, do, to answer June's question and Sam's question. What is the hardest thing they will do any day? And I mean that in the broad, not just the technical, their job sense, but in their being a human being. And what Sam said, what, how, what's the most intimate thing in their lives, okay? And so I, tr I need to find that, whether it's contemporary fiction or historical fiction. Sometimes historical can be harder. Uh, Garden of Martyrs was about uh, two characters that really were not known in history, and a third character a great deal was known about, the first bishop of Boston. And I had to fictionalize, so I had to learn a lot about him. And I had to get over what the stereotypes were about him. For instance, I read his biography by a woman named Melville, okay? Uh, she wrote a biography in the 1950s. In the 1950s, when you wrote a biography of a religious figure, you, you, you did it like this, okay? Uh, they, they, were, they approached the figure with great solemnity and reverence, okay? So, for instance, she has a scene in that book where in... Paris in 1792, during the great slaughter of a priest and other high-ranking officials, what they were called the September Massacres, Father Chevres, my main character, is there on that day, on that fateful day. He goes in, he is not a prisoner, but he goes to minister to the other priests, hundreds of them, in the convent of the Carmes in Paris. And that day, there's a riot, they storm, these, these uh, uh, Parisians storm <coughs> okay, this place, grab the first guy and say, will you swear allegiance to the new government? And the, and the archbishop says, no. <laughs> he cut his head off. Next one. And my character witnesses all that. Melville says, he watched the blood shared, he ran to the wall, climbed the tree, jumped over, and went home. That's what he did? He did that? After seeing all his buddies being chopped up? Okay, so there was research, and it was just the barest bones of of a story. And I took that research, and here's another ex example of what research can do. The research didn't give me anything, but it gave me the possibility of saying, if anybody ever had PTSD, it's going to be this guy. He saw the worst possible thing to all his friends and colleagues. He lived, he snuck away, he cowered, and so I took that and ran with it. Okay? And in, in a sense, it was given to me but in a backhanded way, because nothing was ever said. And she covered it in about half a page. Goodness sakes, that's all she came up with? You know? So, um, all right, other comments, questions? Yes? Why was uh, your magical thinking optional reading? Say it again? Oh, right. The optional reading for the Right. Book. Why? I just think it's a great memoir okay. where you could do research. You could look at that book if you're a memoirist and say, where did she do research? Uh, she came to uh, Fairfield a couple years ago and I interviewed her. Uh, probably the worst interview that I have ever experienced because she didn't want to talk about her book. She didn't give anything away. She wanted to come. She sat there 
and I'm on stage, and I said, so, uh, can you tell us a little bit why you, no. <laughs> All right, question two. Okay, uh, she came one other time, and she was radically different, so I think it, maybe she was still feeling terrible. So, anyway, but that's, I think, all, almost all the things I'm suggesting here can be applied to a, a poetry that's telling a story in some other age. I mean, if you ever read Bill's poetic historical stuff, tons of research goes in that, or if you're writing a, a memoir, okay? Um, anyways, where do I find research? Let me quickly go through this. Internet, obviously, now, libraries, interlibrary loans, uh, knowing a good friend at the library. I'm a horrible researcher. I don't know how to go through all that stuff. But I can get online, I can find things, I know my own way of doing it, okay? And I have good friends at libraries that want to do good things for me. And I got, I probably got, and I have on my computer, probably 400 um, files. Sometimes they're very small. They're mostly are newspaper files or magazine files that Jonathan from the library sent me. Uh, one after, I get three in one day, I get 20 in another day. He just took a mission. <laughs> He's gonna do this, okay? And, and he's been great. He's done this over and over and over again for all of my novels. So no, if you don't know how to do the research, find somebody at a library who wants to do it. They're just sitting there waiting for a novelist to come up and say, hey, can you help me? Sure, sure. How long does it, I mean, it sounds like it takes a really long time to write a single book. <laughs> well, okay. This book taught me, uh, took me because I was directing this program then and uh, doing a lot of other things and um, screwing up my life in other ways. Uh, it took me about three and a half years. Uh, Garden of Mars is about the same thing. Soul Catcher took me 10 months. And there's as much research, I think, in that as, as other ones. So, um, yeah, you, I, don't mean, I don't mean to suggest you want to over-research it. And at some point, I'd be reading a really remarkable story, and I'd say, stop, time out. I'm not interested in that story, I'm interested in my story. And I just need to know this. I don't need to know all of it. For instance, I, I just recently read Unbroken. And I read Unbroken uh, because it's set in 1936. And that's the novel that uh, I will get back to when I finish revising the current one. And that's where my character goes. He goes to the 36 Olympics. And so I had to read it. And I ended up reading the whole thing, but I didn't need to know all the Japanese stuff because that wasn't part of what I needed. I ended up reading the rest, but I, it was, you know, I, I guess it was good for other reasons, but you need to focus and cut out stuff. Okay, um, so I do a lot of research up front. I do research every day. I do research at the finish to make sure I've checked my facts. And by that point, it's more fact checking for credibility, authenticity, precision. For instance, the term soul catcher for that novel. I used that because I thought I came across that term somewhere in all of my research. And, and then I, I said, geez, did I make that up? Did I, whatever? And I looked it up and I couldn't find it, couldn't find it. Finally, uh, I saw it in, in, a, in a Google search, and it was by, used by another writer who wrote sort of historical romances set in, in uh, the early part of the 19th century in New York, the War of 1812 and so on. And I saw it in her, and I wrote to her, and I said, soul catcher, I can't find that term anywhere. And she said, yeah, it was what slaves often called uh, slave catchers, because they not only caught, your, they not only caught your, your body, they caught your soul and brought that back. So I, I said, okay. It's, I, I think I was right on that. So, One last thing, and then completely questions. In terms of verisimilitude, when I finished this book, I said there's all sorts of Russian terms, Ukrainian terms, historical terms, and I'm not quite sure that I have right. In fact, I know some of them are downright wrong. So there's two, there was a person at Fairfield who is um, Ukrainian, and she teaches there. And, um, and her husband is the head of the Russian studies, okay? David McFadden, okay? So I called her and I said, I'll pay you X amount if you go through my book and catch any errors. Well, about a month later, she comes in and David McFadden is with her. And they sit down and they praise my book for 10 minutes. What a great book, blah, 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 blah. And they both are holding something in their hands. And I said, what the hell is this? Um, so I actually got two for the price of one because David didn't take any money, but they both had seven pages of, of mistakes. Single space mistakes. I'll just give you one. At one point in the novel, Tatiana calls somebody a weasel and I wanted to use the Russian term for weasel. And so I put the Russian term. And David said, that's not weasel. I said, I said what do you mean? It does mean weasel. He said, yes, it means weasel. But in Russian, weasel doesn't mean what we mean by weasel. 
I said, okay, what does mean? And he told me, and I put it in, okay? And a bunch of other things like, she probably wouldn't be reading this poet, she might be reading this poet. So historical things. So that was great. And I went through and I, I said, thank you, thank you, thank you. And so there, it was more tactical. But to begin the whole thing, it's intimacy. It's knowing what the hardest thing a person's going to do. It's getting into their skin. It's understanding the fictional landscape. Feeling comfortable. I guarantee if you do enough research, there are going to be gems that are going to be handed to you on a silver platter. And you have to be smart enough to grab them, arrange them for fictional reasons or memoir reasons, and put them in. And not too much, you know, just enough. Okay, so it, it, it gets your, you're telling a story. Whether it be a poem or a memoir or a novel, you're telling a story. Keep that foremost in mind. And all of this research stuff is just to do a better job. Uh, I remember um, James Dickey wrote a novel called To the White Sea. Has anybody read it? It's a beautiful, brutal novel. I would, I would strongly recommend it. And he has one character being a tail gunner on a B-24. And they're doing bombing runs over Japan. And they get shot down. And he's a survivalist. He grew up in, uh, in um, uh, Alaska. And the, and the guy is parachutes down and he lands in Japan. It's not a good place to be in Japan after you've been firebombing them. Okay? And you're a Caucasian. Okay? And so he somehow figures out how to get from here to here to here to here. And I read an interview later and I said, boy, this, this guy must have... Uh, yes, uh, Dickey fought in the war, but he had never been to Japan. Wow. Okay, so here's somebody who did research and pulled it off as if it's real. So however you do it, you're telling a story. Whether you actually go out and do it or do it from home, you have to tell the story and make it believable and get it right. Any... We've got a couple minutes. Any other questions? Yes. I always wondered this thing, so in general, when you're writing about a bygone era where they don't have recording, you know, voices, how do you research colloquial language? Well, I got my hands on two dictionaries of uh, pre-Civil War uh, language. And I still have them on my computer. Um, and it's a, it's, it, was, it had all sorts of colloquial stuff. You know, terms, phrases, expressions. There's one expression that they used before the Civil War called sock dollager. And what it meant was a blow that was a knockout blow. So somebody gave him a sock dollager blow. Now you don't want to use that every word, every other word, but you know, here and there, place, it will give you a sense of how they spoke, okay? Uh, reading, uh, one of my novels is set in, in Ireland. In, uh, well, excuse me, it's, it's uh, set in early America, but it's about two Irishmen from 1805, 1806. How do they talk then, okay, without making them sound like caricatures of Irish, okay? So I got, I remember I got a, 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 uh, a journal by an Irishman written in the 1820s and 30s. And he had a diary and a journal, and he just kept it. And he uses terms, he uses expressions. And I was able to capture a couple. You only need a couple to give a flavor. If, again, if you're making a stew, you put in too much, you spoil it. You, you, you put them in, you put, let's say, language, you put it in delicately. Just like if you're using foreign expressions. You don't want to fill it up because it, become, it can become really annoying. Or foreign expressions or foreign language. You do it delicately to give a flavor. How did you find that, that uh, journal? I just search. Oh, that journal? I, I, um, I forget. I yeah, I mean, there's, there's, lots of, there's lots of stuff. I'll tell you one more example in, in just a moment. But there's lots of stuff. You can, you can easily do Googles now and, and get thousands of hits. When I was doing Tatiana, uh, and I was doing Ludmilla Pavlichenko, there were like five hits. If you went Google Ludmilla Pavlichenko, there must be 5,000 now. I don't know if it's, I don't think it's because, of it, but it, there's a lot more stuff on snipers and, you know, and, and Russian and women and fighting in the war and blah, blah, blah. Uh, you can find, and if you can't do it, you go to the library, say, I'm writing a book, and can you help me? I'm looking for a book on, let's say, uh, Czechoslovakia and folk tales. Okay? Put a something up here. You get a bunch of friends. They, if they don't know it, they know somebody who might know it. Okay? You do it that way. Let me give you one last one. This is kind of fun. In Soul Catcher, Cain gets shot in the side. Okay, for those who read the book, he gets shot in the side, and he's way out in the woods, and he's bleeding to death, and he's got to do something to get that bullet out. 
Um, and so I said, how can he do this? What can he do? And so I called a good friend of mine <coughs> who was a surgeon. He was head of surgery at Bay State Medical. And he was my student up at Stone Coast. So I said, Dave, here's my situation. And let me just give you one aside. He has written the book on how, you can, uh, on how to kill off a character. Okay, if you look up Dave Page, okay, Dave Page, P-A, I don't know if it's G-E or P-A-I-G-E, he's got a book on how you can kill off characters in literature, by poison, by gunshot, blah, blah, blah. He's got it all down. So he's the guy, that, he's the go-to guy. So I said, Dave, how would you, do, and he's, plus he's a surgeon. I said, Dave, here's the situation. A guy's alone, he's been shot, he's got to get a bullet out, he, he's bleeding. Could he do it by himself? And he said, I'm going to give you two answers. I'm going to give a short answer, I'm going to give you a long answer. <laughs> yes. The long answer, I'll get back to you. And so he got back to me a couple days. He talked to several other surgeons at Bay State and buddies of his who are more historical. Have, you know, and he said, yes. I said, he told me about the sterilization and what, what they would know and not know, what he would do. He said, you know, he probably is using something to make his bullets, like a little bullet mold. And that's like a pincer. He probably could use that to go in and take out, find the bullet and take it out. And that's what I used. And then about a year later, Master and Commander of the movie, anybody see that? There's a doctor in there. He commits, he does his own surgery. Mm -hmm. And they're holding a mirror, but he's doing the surgery, taking out the bullet, the, 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 the wound in his stomach. So, yes? Wouldn't it have been more authentic if you had done that on yourself? Yeah. <laughs> There's a limit. There's a limit. Uh, uh, I would rather, um, no, I shouldn't say that. I've been through too many. Okay. Sure. Well, let's just say this. Uh, if you say uh, 1930s Louisiana, okay, if you wanted to find out a book that would give you the best sense of Cajun dialogue in the 1930s, where would I start? There's a guy here named Al Davis. I would start there. And I would say, what do you know? He might tell me two books, and I would go to those books, and I'd look in the bibliography sections of those books, and I'd get two more books. And it'd be like pulling threads and you keep following that. And somewhere along the line, you're going to get a couple of books that are really good. Okay, I can't tell you the dead ends. I, and you will reach dead ends in your research. When I first started doing Lumila Pavlachenko, she had a book. She wrote a book. I said, my God, she wrote a book. I got to get that book. I got that book and it was 80 pages in Russian. <laughs> so I said, I got to find out what she said in that book. <laughs> so I, I gave it to somebody and I paid that somebody to go through it. And they did, and, they, and it was all technical stuff about killing people, shooting people, blah, blah, blah. And it was all militaristic, nothing about herself, and it was virtually worthless, okay? And, you know, it was a dead end. So, any of it. Um, any, last question? Short? Thank you. Good luck. <laughs>